Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest edition of CTSS, You Make the Call. The way this works is you see a pair of images like this with a little bit of history, and we try to think about what's the first thing we think about. Then we'll look at it a little bit further, look at the correct answer, and maybe come up with a few good points. So let's get started. This patient was sent to us PMD Siemens, means pancreatic multidisciplinary conference. But you don't see dilated intrahepatic ducts. If you have a mass this large, it should have dilated ducts. I don't see the rest of the gland, and that's just because we don't have all the images. Now, when I see a large mass, but it's not really in the pancreatic head, and then I gotta think about duodenum, because this, as I said, this mass, if it's primary pancreatic, would be causing obstruction, regardless of the tumor type. So things we think about in that region are duodenal things, like gist tumors, metastasis for melanoma, potentially sarcomas, but that's rare. Most of the tumors in this region, small bowel, are going to be gist and carcinoids. The carcinoids are usually more vascular, so that could be helpful. This patient's lesion was biopsied and eventually resected, and this was a liposarcoma. Now, I don't see any fat. I see a big mass. So we were right it was a sarcoma. Yes, we thought it was a gist. It was a liposarcoma. To make the point that liposarcomas sometimes have minimal fat and sometimes have no fat at all, a really interesting case. Here it is again on the coronal views, nicely showing it, pushing against the pancreas, but probably abutting the pancreas and compressing and displacing rather than arising from the pancreas. Patients joined this, dilated intrahepatic ducts, and a big mass near the pancreas. The first thing you think about a pancreatic cancer, right? You have a mass in the region of the pancreas, there's some duct dilatation. There's no pancreatic duct dilatation. And then you look, and if you looked at all the images, the pancreas looked like it may have been pushed. There's some compression of the portal vein. So you're still thinking pancreatic cancer. If it's duodenum, you got to be thinking about gist. I showed you a case before of a liposarcoma. Well, on biopsy, this was metastatic melanoma. Melanoma is one of the things that can simulate every disease process, can simulate duodenal cancers, can simulate bowel tumors and looking like adenocea or lymphoma or GIST, or in this case, because of the way it's situated, causing duct dilatation, simulating a pancreatic mass. But again, the duct dilatation would have been worse if it was a pancreatic mass and there was no pancreatic duct dilatation. This was melanoma. I've now seen about four melanomas precisely in this region. Um, again, also meds from things like colon cancer can occur in this region. Patient with left upper quadrant pain, there's a mass pushing on the stomach. Yes, you could say maybe the patient had pancreatitis and a pseudocyst, that would be a thought. But I'll tell you that wasn't the case. There was no pancreatitis. So what could this be? It looks like it's in the wall of the lesion and it's cystic. And that is an unusual lesion, but you have to think about a duplication cyst. Gastric duplication cysts can be small or large, usually discovered at a younger age, not at an older age. It's an incidental finding. It'll be resected. Most of them are going to be asymptomatic. Anything can become symptomatic simply because mass effect, if they get large enough, they can cause symptoms. And just to comment, 7% of GI tract duplications or gastric duplication cysts. Again, most are discovered in infancy. But again, it's something to think about. We've had a number of them in the age 30 to 70 range. So... It's also an older person's disease. GI bleed. There's a mass that's submucosal in the lesser curvature of the body of the stomach. What could I think about? I can think about a carcinoid tumor. That would be good. I can think about a met from a renal cell. Unusual, but that would be good. 
a polypoid lesion, which is vascular and bled. That's a good thought as well, as is a small carcinoma that's vascular. It doesn't have the look of lymphoma. It could be a small gist tumor. This was biopsied and was a glomus tumor. Glomus is something you also should consider. They're vascular lesions, usually submucosal. And if you look hard at this lesion's coronal view, it is submucosal in location. So it's really a good thought. It's a benign vascular tumor of the stomach. Again, gastric antra, most common, usually solitary. And it's really an interesting differential diagnosis. Vascular gastric lesions, I was quizzing people on that last week. Think about carcinoid, think about ectopic pancreas, think about glomus, think about METs, are all possibilities. And here's an example of another glomus tumor, very similar in appearance, a little bit sharper, marginated perhaps, but in the patient's antrum. So again, think about a glomus tumor. These will be resected and the patient will do fine. Patient with abdominal distension. The thing I notice most beyond the ascites is the thickening of the stomach. Look particularly at the gastric fundus, but also toward the body. So am I dealing with a gastric adenocarcinoma with carcinomatosis? That's what I would need to be thinking about. But what else can do it? When you're thinking about infiltration of the stomach with ascites, you also should say, could, does this patient have a history of breast cancer? Because infiltrating adenocarcinoma and linitis plastica from breast cancer can look very similar. And in fact, this was linitis plastica in a patient with breast cancer. Again, the differential diagnosis, history is very helpful, but the appearance becomes critical. Thinking about that infiltrating tumor, it also gives me a moment to remind everybody about the importance of protocol. If the stomach was not distended in this patient, you probably would have walked by the gastric wall thickening. And here it is nicely shown in the coronal view. One could say the patient has a lot of food in the stomach. Maybe they just ate. But what happens is when you have linitis plastica, you have poor contractility of the stomach. And so it looks like there's food matter in the stomach. That's also a very helpful sign to me. Someone could look at this and say, well, how do I know it's just the stomach that's not distended? But this is as distended as it gets. And a very good look at linitis plastica. Patient has an FUO, cystic lesion in the liver. We always think about METs, but you gotta think about abscesses. Abscesses can have thick rims, so can necrotic tuber. History and extra hepatic findings will help. This patient was young, had travel. There's a lot of entities that can cause liver abscesses, diverticulitis is one, endocarditis is two. But if you see right lobe lesions that are cystic, you got to think about amoebic abscesses. And here's the lesion on venous phase. You can see the thick rim. Amoebic abscesses are classic in the right lobe of the liver. And this was an amoebic liver abscess. Just a very nice example. This patient lived in the suburbs of Baltimore, but had traveled to Mexico for a couple weeks about a month earlier. Elevated liver function tests. This is an easy case um, in the sense that it's a very vascular tumor. Could be a hepatoma, could be metastasis. You're not thinking about anything benign. It's an aggressive looking tumor. This ended up, look at the neovascularity. Again, the point about looking at um, MIP imaging for liver is really helpful. You'll see feeding vessels like with FNH or hepatic adenomas. You'll see early changes with hepatoma. And you can see in this case, very impressive neovascularity. This still could be a hepatoma. Hepatomas can have pseudocapsules. Here it is on the venous phase with that pseudocapsule and tumor necrosis. And this was a myosarcoma metastatic to the liver. Again, not my first diagnosis. I still would have gone with hepatoma, and then I would have thrown metastasis in there. But again, you're not going to confuse this with a benign lesion. 
You're not going to say FNH, hepatic adenoma, or anything else. Patient with abdominal pain, and what you see on these images is it looks like by the gallbladder fossa, there's carcinomatosis. There are multiple nodules present in the right abdominal wall, and there's a nodule near the level of the umbilicus that's projected anteriorly. So this is carcinomatosis. You can argue, could it be gallbladder cancer? Could it be liver cancer or something else? But the question is, what's that nodule? Well, that nodule here is a classic tumor implant. It goes by a specific name. It was originally described in pancreatic cancer at the level of the umbilicus, which this is. And it's called, here it is very nicely on the sagittal view, as well as some of the carcinomatosis. Here it is seen nicely on the cinematic rendering at the level of the umbilicus. It's a Sister Mary Joseph nodule, originally described in pancreatic cancer, but can be seen in other things. And in this case was seen with gallbladder cancer. Sister Mary Joseph nodules can be seen at presentation, can occur later, but once you have a Sister Mary Joseph nodule, it means that patient is not resectable because they have carcinomatosis, unfortunately. And again, here's just a comment about that. Sister Mary Joseph Dempsey, an assistant of William James Mayo, okay, the 1864 metastatic umbilical nodule. Just a really good trivial point in medicine. It's uncommon. Again, GI tract most common, but you can see from the list, uh, it can be a very helpful sign. And sometimes, I think we're doing better now in this article way back when from uh, the uh, British Journal of General Practice, 30% of the time, they couldn't find a primary. I think we're doing better now. And that's it. Those are our latest and greatest set of cases. Um, you make the call. Again, two images. Think about it. Differential. It's not always the final answer that matters. It's how you think about it and how you manage to work up the patient. And with that, I thank you for your attention. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.